Hi there everybody, my name is Jeremy Krug and I'd like to welcome you back to another chemistry video. In this video, we're learning about temperature. By the way, if you're new to my channel, please consider subscribing. And if you like what you see and learn something from my video, please consider slamming that like button as well. I would really appreciate that. Now, like I said, in this video, we're learning about the concept of temperature. Now, I think most of us have a, a basic idea as to what temperature is. It's basically how hot or how cold something is. From a molecular standpoint, though, we can say that the temperature of an object is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules in that object. Now, as we say kinetic energy, there are two factors in kinetic energy. And we talk about this more in physics, but there's mass and there's velocity. We know that an object with more mass is going to have more kinetic energy, isn't it? If we take a ping pong ball and we accidentally drop it on someone's foot, it's not going to pack quite as much energy as if you take a, a bowling ball and accidentally drop that on someone's foot. Hope you don't ever experience that, by the way. Also, velocity. We know that if you have something moving at a faster velocity or a faster speed, it's going to pack a lot more energy than something moving at a much slower velocity. For example, that same ping pong ball that we just talked about, if you were to propel that out of some sort of a projectile at you know, a couple hundred meters per second, it could do a whole lot of damage, couldn't it? Even though it doesn't have much of a mass. So the more mass something has and the higher velocity something has, the more kinetic energy that object is going to, to possess. Now, let's think about how we could ask and answer some of these questions about temperature and average kinetic energy, perhaps on a homework assignment or on a quiz or a test. Let's say we have a question like this. This is a straight up temperature conversion problem. Convert 25 degrees Celsius to Kelvins. Now, if you have the conversion equation for Celsius to Kelvins, that makes this a whole lot easier, doesn't it? Uh, Kelvin is equal to Celsius plus 273. Sometimes, if you want to be a little bit more precise, you can say 273.15. Much of the time, though, it's not necessary to be quite that precise. But in, the, in this case, if we take 25 degrees Celsius and add 273 to that, we're going to get that this temperature is equal to 298 Kelvins, aren't we? Now we could do something similar. Some of us are more familiar with the Fahrenheit temperature scale, and that's fine as well. Convert 10 degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit. Well, if you ever need to convert between Celsius and Fahrenheit, this is the equation for that. Degrees Celsius times 1.8 plus 32 equals degrees Fahrenheit. So if we have 10 degrees Fahrenheit, you can just plug that into this spot right here. And 10 times 1.8 is 18. 18 plus 32 equals 50. So 10 degrees Celsius equals 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, how about some other questions? Let's say we have a question like this. Which has more average kinetic energy? Particles of water at 20 degrees Celsius or water at 30 degrees Celsius? Well, once again, we have to remember that average kinetic energy is basically just a fancy phrase for temperature, isn't it? So this is like saying, which has the higher temperature? And of course, the answer is water at 30 degrees Celsius. How about this question? Which has more average kinetic energy? Particles of mercury at 50 degrees Celsius or mercury at 70 degrees Celsius? Well, well, well once again, average kinetic energy is the same thing as temperature, isn't it? So which has the higher temperature? Of course, that would be mercury at 70 degrees Celsius. What about a question like this? Which has more average kinetic energy? Particles of liquid water at 100 degrees Celsius or steam, that's gaseous water, at 100 degrees Celsius? Now, some students will read this question and think, well, steam feels like it's it's hotter, isn't it? Well, as it turns out, that's not the case. Since both of these substances are at the same temperature, they have the same or equal amounts of average kinetic energy in their particles. Uh, as long as they're at the same temperature, they'll have the same average kinetic energy. So don't be fooled by a question like that. 
Now, as we think about temperature and, and heat, let's think about how heat flows. Now, many of us have heard that heat rises. And it is true that warmer fluids will tend to rise, but that's generally because those fluids tend to have a lower density. It's not always going to be the case that heat is going to rise. For example, if we have a heat lamp, perhaps you've been to a buffet or a restaurant where they have a heat lamp that's shining down on the food. How is it possible that that heat lamp that's shining down on the food is keeping the food warm if heat only rises? You see, in this case, the heat would have to be projected downward. So heat doesn't always rise. However, heat always does flow from an area of higher heat to an area of lower heat. That's the direction of heat flow. Now let's think about this for a moment. Let's imagine that we have something that's rather warm. Let's imagine we have a nice hot bowl of soup. So you can imagine a nice hot bowl of soup in a bowl right there. But instead of eating that soup, let's imagine that you just decide to leave that soup out on the table. Just let it sit there. Now what's going to happen to the temperature of that soup if you just let it sit there? Well, it's going to get colder, isn't it? Now where is the heat going? If the soup is getting colder, that heat has to go somewhere, right? So where does it go? Well, it makes sense that it's going to flow out to the surroundings. So that means that the temperature of that soup is going to get colder and the temperature of the room around it is going to get warmer, isn't it? Now, does that mean that when we walk into the room the next morning, we're going to find a frozen bowl of soup there? No, that's not what's going to happen, isn't it? The question is, until what point? Until what point will that soup keep dropping in temperature? Well, we know that if the soup gets colder, and the room around it gets warmer ever so slightly, they're going to meet somewhere in the middle, aren't they? And they're going to equilibrate. So that tells us that eventually they're going to have the same temperature. The soup will eventually have the same temperature as the room around it. And you've probably experienced this if you've left food out, uh, perhaps on a table, and didn't eat it. It, it eventually gets cold and it is room temperature, isn't it? So that's how that works. This is something called thermal equilibrium, by the way. This is what happens when the particles in the soup collide with some of the particles in the air around the soup, and it transfers some of its energy to the molecules in the air. Eventually, they have the same temperature. Now, as we talk about temperature and heat, it's probably very wise of us to just review the states of matter We've learned about these states of matter before in this course, but let's talk about them again. We know what a solid is like, don't we? In a solid, we have a fixed shape, we have a fixed volume, and the molecules normally have fairly fixed positions. They're able to vibrate against each other, but there's not a whole lot of freedom of motion going on there. So that's in a solid. In a liquid, we know that the molecules are usually a little bit farther apart from each other, so they have a little bit more freedom of motion, don't they? The molecules can kind of slip and slide around each other. That's why a liquid flows. A liquid will take the shape of its container, although liquids do have a fairly fixed volume. Now, how about a gas? Well, in a gas, the molecules are much farther apart from each other, aren't they? Molecules in a gas are basically independent of each other. They can go pretty much anywhere. We've, we've talked about what a gas is like in an, an earlier video of this uh, chapter here about the kinetic molecular theory. We know that there's some collision going on there, but pretty much the molecules in a gas are independent of each other and they can go anywhere they want to inside that container. That's why a gas can expand, a gas can contract, a gas takes the shape and the volume of its container. Now, perhaps you've heard of a plasma as well. A plasma is essentially an ionized state in which the electrons have been stripped away from their nuclei. So an example of a plasma might be the sun, for example. This is a very hot, very energetic state in which the vapor or the gas there is ionized so much that it's not really a gas anymore. It's, it's, it's a plasma. It's something completely different. 
Um, we can also say that lightning produces an amount of plasma as well. There are plasmas, perhaps plasma cutters you've heard of in certain types of industry. Uh, this is an important ionized state uh, that is actually quite common in space. In fact, I would go out on a limb here and say that there's probably more plasma than there would be any other state of matter in the universe because all the stars are composed of huge amounts of plasma. And so we can think of that state of matter as well. Now there is a fifth state of matter that maybe you're not familiar with. This is something called a Bose-Einstein condensate. And if a plasma is a very, very hot state of matter, then we can say that a Bose-Einstein condensate is a very, very cold state of matter. In fact, it's so cold that the particles have almost no kinetic energy. So cold that the molecules are almost stopped. We know that at absolute zero, if we could ever attain that temperature, the molecules would completely stop their motion. Well, in a Bose-Einstein condensate, we're not quite there to absolute zero, but we're very, very close. In fact, they're moving so slowly that strange things start to happen to these molecules. In fact, they stop behaving like particles and they start behaving more like waves of light. And so this is a very unusual state of matter. This was only discovered in the 1990s. And so we don't know a whole lot about Bose-Einstein condensates, or at least not nearly as much as we do about solids, liquids, and gases, or even plasmas. But it's an interesting thing to think about. So these are the five states of matter that I want to share with you in this video. Solid liquid gas, plasma, and Bose-Einstein condensate. I hope you've enjoyed this video about uh, heat and temperature and the states of matter. If you learned something from this video, please smash that like button. I would really appreciate it. And if you aren't a subscriber yet, consider subscribing. This is the place for all things high school chemistry, uh, honors chemistry, general chemistry, AP chemistry. My name is Jeremy Krug. I hope to see you in the next video where we can learn some more chemistry together.